Welcome to That Moto Show with Dirt Bike TV's Jake Clark and producer Donnie Bales. Number eight. That's hard to believe. Uh, this is our tech podcast, number eight. Uh, number seven was pretty fun. We had actually a pro mechanic guest. If you didn't listen to that, you can go back and listen to that with Jade Dungey. Um, you recognize the last name, but he's also a current mechanic for uh, Aaron Plessinger. He's been a mechanic for Sexton and different riders. So uh, really good, good story. We're going to get back to kind of our roots of our first few podcasts where it's just Donnie and I talking. We don't have Spencer here today, unfortunately. He's uh, not feeling well he's not terribly sick he just sounds terrible and i just have a tiny bit of it he's got like 80 percent more of it and he just sounds terrible so it wouldn't be very good what do you think donnie yeah you sure he doesn't have an eye problem you know he just can't see himself coming here and <laughs> doing the podcast no no uh, you know uh, hopefully spencer feels better soon but yeah um anyway the last podcast uh with jade was really fun and, and i saw a lot of comments from people how they realized how enthusiastic he was uh, uh, like about bikes and the industry. And, and that was really fun to have him here for that. Yes, it was. And there was a lot of really good comments. A lot of guys really aspire, you know, would like to be a mechanic on that level. So it's really cool for, to, for a lot of guys to get that feel. We're going to have some more on. We have uh, quite a few friends who are, who do this. So we'll have some more mechanics on here, get some of their takes on stuff and kind of tips and st things like that. Also, try to kind of get how they got into it. So that might help guys that are looking to do that in the future. So we'll have some more of that coming. Right behind you, I got a 24 250 Honda, CRF 250R. And I'm shooting that with uh, Swap Moto Live. This is their bike. Uh, Don's, gonna, they're gonna be shooting this and we're gonna be shooting uh, later this week. And uh, it's really cool looking bike. I'm so. sure that, I mean, I'm not sure, but you know, camera never shows things how they actually are. And I'm telling you, this bike in person is just really amazing looking. <laughs> Decal Works just hits it out of the park every time. And then, and then, D, and then a Moto Seat will make us a seat cover that matches. Man, it looks so cool. And so I'm always able to do some fun, you know, different things. And because with my builds, it doesn't have to be race legal, right? Like, so the number plates can be different colors and I can kind of do things a little bit customized. I'm a real fan of the sparkles. Uh, I've yeah. had several of mine that have, I actually, my SXF has sparkles on it. I don't know, man. I like, I feel really. Yeah. If I had a bass boat, I think I would for sure. Cause the bass boats all do that. They do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was kind of a, a, yeah. a fun thing there. So anyway, so unfortunately no Spencer today, but we're ready to get on. Oh, and if you, if you want to get your questions answered e on this show or even just questions, just email me. You can go to our website. Uh, you can click on, you know, contact. It's really easy to email us. DMs don't work. You're just going to get a response that back that says to email us with our email address. So you can just email us there. It's pretty simple. Um, and it's, it's J A Y at dirtbike TV one. Pretty simple, right? Yeah, and this is show eight. Did we already say that? Yeah, show eight. Show oh, eight. eight. But, but, but show us what we got there for sure. I got, uh, well, you know. I'm, and I'm, you're wearing a shirt from number eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah fortunately, GL's a buddy of ours, yeah. and uh, we get to go ride with him and stuff. And he was kind enough to give me these two uh, number championship placards um, and sign them. They were kind of cool. I, those I actually, are, Those are real cool. Yeah, I, I probably begged him for them because I saw him at his house or something, and uh, he was cool enough to give me a couple of them. But even though they say number one, it's our guy number eight. Also, you know, there's another number eight, which I really like, and that's Albie, right? He was number eight as well. And it's funny that they're both South African, but uh, yeah, anyway, we're on show eight. That's that's awesome. And so, yeah, we're just jamming right along. I think everybody's liking that. And if you like the show, share them with your family, friends, whoever. A lot of people maybe aren't aware of it, so... Dirt Bike TV's uh, That Moto Show, you know, share it around. So, all right, Don, you got our first question for us? I'm ready to go. Okay. Okay, uh, Moto 619 Films says, on the new gen um, KTM linkage bikes, what chain slacks are you guys running? 65 to 68 millimeter, question mark? Okay, so that number that he's throwing out there on these new generation KTM bikes, 23, 24, and it will be the 25 as well. They, Those bikes, um, there was some kind of information going on early that they should be that loose, but it's way too loose. That's like a really loose four fingers, you know, and we go by four fingers. And that's why over the years, we always did three fingers right by the chain guide. And that was close enough for most all of our bikes. What's important about chain slack, what people don't realize is if you run it way too loose, you risk actually derailing your chain. You risk wearing out your chain and sprockets even quicker, which we've already talked about how on four strokes, they already wear out chains and sprockets too quick anyway. So you want it at the optimal spot. And if you're ever curious, if you ever have your shock off your bike, when your shock's off the bike, you with the rear wheel on, you can hold and move with, with the bike on a stand, you could put a jack under the rear wheel. There's different ways you could do it, but you could move the, the rear wheel through the travel 
when you have your slack set at what you think is best and make sure that you still have slack and you'll find the tightest spot on the arc of the, how the wheel travels. So at that tightest spot, you still want to have slack. And that's how they come up with that. So on the new generation bikes we run, uh, Works Connection has a cool little block that's 58 to 61. And that's where we, we're running it. And we tend to be on that 61. The, the lowest we are is 59, which is nice about this little block. Guy goes, well, I can just use my fingers. And that's totally fine. You can make your own one of these with some PVC or whatever. If you get your calipers out, you can make your own. You can use a bolt at the right length. You can do whatever you want. But Works Connection has a really cool piece that works really well for it. And on their piece, if you turn it sideways, it's the, in between the two numbers that they offer. And they offer different ranges of sizes for different bikes. So, Hey, speak really about helpful. how important it is for different brands to check that because i know the pivot um the swing arm pivot has a uh, is where the chain slack come, kind of comes from right yeah and so it's going to be different geometry on different bikes so it's it's uh, what works on a ktm is isn't it going to be the same on a yamaha so they're different chain slacks they're in the same general range but for the most part you want to be careful and your manual will tell you how much slack they suggest and you can also get some tips from a lot of the manuals will be real conservative with a big range because they're worried about people riding in the mud if you ride in the mud you want to loosen up that slack a little bit so that you allow room to get some mud packed in there if you're riding in dry normal conditions let's say then you can be in the tighter end of the slack if you're too tight what you risk is damaging the actual engine the, the transmission the, the bearing there on your output shaft you can actually damage that bearing by being too stiff under load and can actually damage the bike. Could that also wear out a chain quicker? Like oh, yeah, I think anything, yeah, could cause damage throughout the line. I think a looser chain actually causes more wear, but okay. that's just my go. thought. All right, uh, Jerika V. Hi, Jay. I have a question. A KTM SXF 350 2021. When I start the engine, the orange light is continuously flashing. Does this indicate a problem with the engine? Or the electronics because the engine seems to work normally thanks for the answer okay so this is a really unique one i remember answering him uh, the other day and with with most of the bikes now the fuel injected bikes he thought his light was just flashing and saying i'm just randomly staying on but it was actually telling him something it's a code and it was flashing a code and i'll have that code playing we have a little video that he sent us so i'll have that code playing uh donnie can put that in and you can see this one was flashing one long flash and then five short flashes. So sometimes you'll need to watch it play through a few times and you can catch how many long, how many short. There's different codes and you can simply, a lot of times you can just put that the codes into Google, put KTM after and you can find it. Or better yet, you can just go to your manual. We have links from our Google doc on how to get to the KTM manuals. Go to KTM manuals. You can find your bike and then get right down to the diagnostics area. We'll have those codes. Like we looked in one book, it was like towards the end of the book, like 150 uh, was the page number back in there. The table of contents will show you how to find those codes. So it's not as simple as this. And in, in this case, it turned out to be his rollover sensor. Now, when I looked it up and then we checked, it was a rollover sensor. So then I'm like, well, it's weird. It's running. So Turns out he bought the bike secondhand. Somebody had unplugged it, so it wasn't it wasn't there. So maybe they had robbed it off for another bike. I, I don't know. So he found that it was unplugged. Yeah, it was gone. So I texted. I wrote him back and said, "Hey, it's a rollover sensor. It's not." And I go, "So check under the seat by your ECU there, and you're going to see a little sensor. And it actually says up on it. Those those sensors say up. They have to sit in a certain position. I'm not sure on the new gen bikes. I haven't checked the 23, 24 to see what they're using for a tip over sensor. But the, on the 22 and older's. That's how they, and, and that tip over sensor, we, that rollover sensor we found out is the same for like every bike, a, a right. 690 to a whatever, everything. To KTM is always really good about that. Sure. So, so anyway, so if you see flashes, those are, those are there to help you. And usually your bike's not running right when you get flashes. In this case, he was running okay. So the, it was a bit of a quandary to him. So, uh, those flashes are helpful. All right. There you go. Well, this one, uh, this one comes, it's really close to the heart, this next one too. <laughs> uh, Parker D and Nathan Arm, they have the same question. Uh, a few months ago, you posted a video on Instagram of yeah. fixing the FMF when Donnie dropped his bike. <laughs> Just wondering if you had uh, sandblasted or vapor blasted wanting to clean mine up. And I think the gray titanium looks better than the blue. You know, first of all, let me say before you get into the answer, 
I actually love the way that color looks. It, it came out really I cool. I didn't think it would look that good. I was kind of like, well, I'm just going to live with it because right. it is what it is. But the, I actually think it's, I wouldn't say improved over the blue, but it looks as good as the blue. Right. So it came out really cool. The key, the key to anything you're going to do, whether it's, say you're going to clean up some parts on your bike, whether it's a, a linkage or a swing arm or a, a guard, you can sand it with any type of sanding or scotch bright, anything like that to get all the scrapes out. And then... The nice thing about vapor blasting, then that's what we used in this case was vapor blasting. The vapor blasting will blend in and take all those scratches and kind of erase them to where it all looks even and the same. So on, on, the, on Donnie's muffler, it had some scratches. We sanded most of those out where you can hardly tell, but then you could see that his muffler was, was blue here and had all these sand marks and you know where it had been polished. So when we vapor blasted, it blended it all in. You couldn't even tell. So um, vapor blasting works really good for that. So if you have a buddy that has one of those, uh, be extra nice to him, right? Hey, first, first of all, uh, the thing about that trip is at least I fell, I fell two times in like 15 minutes, <laughs> but that was basically it for the rest of the weekend. Then you got, you got it, you got I it got out, it out of, of the way. Anyway. Oh, and for whatever it's worth, if you're, if you're in SoCal, we use Sano Metal Finishing has the vapor blaster. If you're in SoCal area, that, that can help you. I've taken so many parts over to him yeah. and they come out like he knows what he's doing. He that, that really comes out nice. Yeah. All right. Shelby in California. Hey, Jay, I know you had a shoulder injury a few months back and was wondering what you wear for protection for that injury. In your experience, is there a chest protector that covers the collarbone and the rib area more than others? Thanks and keep up the good work. Okay. So this is a really tough one. And this is, I think I'll give another Dr. J question later too. So I, I do get these doctor questions. I'm not sure. Call sh me Dr. J. <laughs> there we go. So the, the uh, it's a tough thing to suggest or give recommendations on safety equipment because at the end of the day it's it's on you i don't think there's any type of equipment you could wear say you had football shoulder pads on and a you know, like the quarterbacks wear the uh flak jacket and everything and are all connected i don't know if it would have prevented my shoulder injury when i was falling down a cliff I don't think it would have because it was more about bending my arm back is what, what happened. So a lot of times when you're bending stuff back or too far down, I don't know. And then the problem comes in when you wear excessive uh, equipment. You say you had huge shoulder pads and huge protection. I think it would limit you so much that it would potentially cause you to crash more often than not. And so that's an argument that goes to whether it's knee braces or neck braces, any of that stuff, it goes all around to where is this going to make me feel safer on the bike? Am I going to be able to still move correct well and not cause me to crash? I've worn some pieces of equipment that I feel like have contributed to me crashing. And then I was like, well, this isn't good. You know, you so, should listen to Rhino on some of that because right. he has some serious opinions on what can and can't make you crash and, and with I, safety equipment. Yeah. And, and I do feel like neck braces are one of those things that are tough. I wore them for a while and I still have a hard time going back to them because I do feel like it compromises how I ride and puts me in a, in a not as good of a rider position to where it's compromising how well I can ride. So then knee braces are one that he talks about a lot. And I like, I wore, I went without wearing knee braces for a while. I like it, but I feel like it's better for guys that are totally fit. I think if you're really a good athlete, totally fit and strong and doing tons of training, you're probably better off without knee braces. I think you're better with the bike and all that. If you're old slow guy who doesn't train like that, I think for me, I'm finding that I'm better off with the braces. So I, I also did the same thing where I took them off for a while and then I rode and, and they felt good. But then when I got back on, I actually feel like I, at that, that's the one thing I felt way safer with. Now in my shoulder, hey, I will say when I um, when I was coming back, I came back really quick. As you know, I just kept pretty much riding without much of a break. Are you going to send me that video? You know, the shoulder injury. <laughs> yeah, video? I could do that. Maybe yeah. we could put that in there. That was. I'll put that in. It there. was tough to watch, actually. It was terrible. <laughs> People that ride know, like it, it actually looks moderately benign yeah. if you don't know like that kind of an area that you were in <laughs> and how far you fell down. It was. It was terrible. We rode by there the other day that area. And I was like, Oh no, let's get out of here. <laughs> Bad mojo right there. <laughs> Bad mojo. So, uh, when I was coming back, I've wore a different couple braces, which helped a bit, but what actually was the most comfortable the last six months was, uh, KT tape. We just got tape and I got the cheaper stuff. I tried KT and then they had some other stuff on Amazon and there's different techniques of taping your shoulder that I used. And that actually worked pretty good. It felt better strength wise. So, so the KT tape, 
takes the dermis and it lifts it off the muscle. And so it allows the sleeve underneath the skin mm -hmm. and the muscle to move kind of independently. Mm -hmm. So it's not pulling on those areas as hard. When I find, and I Googled, there's different, there's tons of videos showing different techniques to tape yeah. whatever you're looking for. You yeah. gotta, if you have a, mm -hmm. like I have an Achilles problem here, it shows you how to do that. You hold yeah. your shoulder from, from this injury, from the, whatever. So there, it is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. The only reason I know that is from the other <laughs> business we have. <laughs> All right. So All right. David H. Hello. When doing a top end on a newer bike with Nika seal or plated cylinder, should you, or should you not hone it for the best cross hatching? There's so many polarizing opinions abound. Love the content. Uh, also, as a child from the 80s, I love your choice of music spotlight. Thanks. Very good. Okay. Thanks, David. All right. So, what I find is that if it's a newer bike, let's say a newer, and we're talking about two strokes. I, I, he doesn't say that, does he? I assume he doesn't. He just says on a newer bike. That's all he says. Okay, so let's go. Let's go two strokes first. So two strokes. I, I did one last week, a brand new twenty three three hundred SX. Didn't even touch it. It looked perfect. I didn't feel like there was any reason to touch it. So on these current two strokes, say a Yamaha or a KTM, if you're uh, you know under hundred hours, let's say you're you're everything looks mint. I would just leave it. Just throw a new piston in. Call it good. Now, if it's an older bike, it has some time on it, and if it's a four-stroke, you're not doing it nearly as often. I for sure would would probably just quickly hone it, and then for that, you need a good one, and they're not too expensive. They're like seventy dollars through. Uh, Weisco has these nylon brushes that, or we'll have a picture of them right here or here. One of the two. We'll have a picture in here. Those are really helpful, uh, and that's the, the type of material it is. It's not like a ball hone. It's a little different, and just really quick with that through there, that'll get any glaze off and help the ring seal quicker. But again, on a current bike that's you know one to three years old that doesn't have a ton of hours and it looks fine, I wouldn't bother. You're good to go. All, All right. right. There you go. Next. All right. Steven. Steven is just Steven. Hello, yeah. buddy. Seeking some recommendation. I raced my FC 250. I'm not that abusive on the clutch. What replacement clutch kit do you recommend? How often should I change? Thanks. Okay, so with clutches, we get, we get a lot of clutch questions, and the guys are asking time frame, like, the, like a piston or a suspension fluid. With clutches, some guys on the same, like that 250, we'll call it a 250 K KTM Husky, uh, 350, 450. We have some guys that can go five hours, eight hours, you know, two hours, and they're riding in the sand and mud, or they can go a hundred hours. So there really isn't usually a timeout as far as too long. It, it, it's about inspecting the clutch. So on a stock, KTMs typically have the best stock clutch and durability of all the bikes. So we don't usually smoke a KTM style clutch very often at all. The only places I would do it is on hill climbs excessively if I'm getting stuck and fanning the clutch and you know, I'm in third and I should be in second or, or you know, I'm in second. I got to shift to first. I'm fanning that thing and just ruining it. So that's the only times I would smoke a clutch per se. Um, and then in that bike, we would put in a torque drive, which is still a conventional clutch from Recluse. And so those work really well and uh, real happy with that. And a few bikes like that Honda behind you with the stock clutch, we couldn't get them to live at all. Like on a sandy, our hill tracks, an hour. We were smoking, you know, stock or anything else. We'd smoke it. We put in the torque drive just killed it do so. you know uh like is one brand of bike a little better clutch system than another well i think the ktm bikes are the best by far they have a steel basket and uh that single bevel spring the components are all really well i think there's a lot of oil lubrication to everything so i think that's really all all that contributes i think and the bikes make good power typically so you're not having to fan the clutch a lot so a bike that is underpowered a little bit and you're having to fan the clutch more that's going to wear out clutches more um, that, that Honda and the, and the Yamaha 250F have both been a bit susceptible in the last few years. Uh, that, and, and what's downside about these bikes nowadays, if they break a clutch plate, like on that bike or the Yamaha, um, then it would get down into everything. Now, the Yamaha, the 24, got updated. So, it's so would you have to pull everything apart when yeah, that happens? Yeah, ide yeah ideally, yes. You I mean, you're going to get into crank bearings. and it, It's going to go into everything. So we have flushed some bikes out. I think I have a question later that talks about yeah. asking similar questions, but you, you can, you, you want to get all those pieces out. Um, and there's different ways 
different ways to do that. I remember in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, I always had Yamahas then. And the Yamahas, the clutch, uh, the drive plates would end up wearing into the clutch basket. Yeah. And you'd have to file them all straight. The clutch wouldn't work, remember? They wouldn't right. disengage. Right. Yeah, and, and then and those would end up breaking. Yeah, so that's why it's nice to have a good, you know, the baskets nowadays typically are a lot stronger than they used to be. So you yeah, don't get yeah. That I think much. a steel basket is, is the way to go. For sure. All right, Tom B., ever have a rider, any rider break his patella tendon how long is recovery for that thanks and i don't know if it's tear patella tendon or break your patella something like that okay okay we'll call it a, a knee injury i'm just gonna say two months and I'm, I'm highly qualified as a doctor and i'm gonna say that <laughs> two months about anything you should be able to ride around now maybe maybe you're not riding and i think if you ride bikes you know that even if you get on and ride around maybe the cul-de-sac where you live or just down the you know driveway to get the mail or whatever you got that can be a good fix, right? Just that well, listen, feeling. you got to do like like we like you got rid of yours, but I have my Grom, and whenever right. I was injured, that would be my first tester. Is I would ride the Grom down to the riverbed or something. Yeah. How do I feel just riding that around here? Just yeah. something about it hitting. And sometimes I don't wear goggles; I'll just have the helmet on, and just the air coming in just feels yeah. good. To Let get your out. eyes water. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Feels good. All right, I got one from Mike Z, and this is a mouthful, so I'm just gonna give it to you. Go. Jay, you probably haven't run into this uh, before personally, but Anyway, I let my son's clutch go a little long on his 23 KTM 85. It didn't blow up or anything, but the aluminum plates are toast, I think. I had surgery and totally missed an oil change between races. I dropped the oil before the last arena cross race a few weeks ago, and it was kind of gray in color. Not milky like coolant was in there, but just gray. A magnet did not attract the flow of oil while draining it, and I did a quick flush before the last race. I didn't have time to do a clutch, so we just sent it, and he hasn't been back since riding since we're up in southeastern Idaho and there's nowhere to ride. I'm doing a full recluse torque drive and want to clean out as much of the remaining particles as possible. When I have the clutch side open, can you tell me if contact cleaner or alcohol will damage anything once the basket and all the clutch components are removed? Or do you have recommendations on what should should I use? Thanks. Okay. It is a lot. And it's, it, but for whatever it's worth, when guys email me, it's nice and they give me more description. This is, a, this, is all, this is all the information you need. Right. So it gives me a lot of information. And then some guys will even send in photos, which is real helpful. So, so if it's anything that would be beneficial to have a photo from, that's really nice. So good description with a photo. If you say you're having problems with it not running well or starting well, uh, break down what you've done or tried and maybe anything that's happened right before it started doing that. So in this case, Couple things. First of all, I'm not 100% sure those plates are truly aluminum. Um, most bikes have stopped using aluminum. I, I'm not positive that they are or not. I haven't checked them personally. What's the abuse level on, say, an 85 it compared can, to a bigger bike? It can be bad if a kid is really learning, um, you know, and not just abusing. I think I didn't know what the clutch was. My first race, you know, is at Indian Dunes. Okay, did I tell you about this? No. And we're on this little track, you know, at the top above the Shadow Glen or the International Track. The Shadow. The one above there it was a night race it okay a, i know that one. yeah it was above there it was and part of the dirt track though it was close this, to there it was yeah. a pretty simple track but i was riding around and everybody was going like this they were all going like this right like and i thought they were all cheering for me right well apparently they were all telling me to shift because i just had it in second nice and never let off dude penned it just it yeah yeah never let it off i'm like I, I obviously I was racing way too on soon. that RM80 RM80 I think yeah it was yeah so it was like so the, so I, I never shifted it but so I wasn't wearing out a clutch just just the rod bearings and and all that kind of stuff so in this case um, if you, it's totally fine if, here's a couple tips I would do if you have a smoked clutch and you pour it out you can smell it's nasty one of the things I would do is put in like three quarters of the amount of oil back in the bike. And that's why we use a cheap oil, for instance. You can dump it in there, like three, say it normally takes 800, throw in 500, 600. Throw in there, start it up for two or three minutes. Just rev it up, ride it for a second, bring it in, dump it out while it's hot. It's going to get out a lot of that stuff. Okay, so then it's, you got, you've kind of flushed a lot of that out with that recent oil change while it's hot. Then you can pull all your clutch apart, like he was saying, and then contact cleaner is totally fine. We have clots, for instance, and just spray it in there. Lay the bike all the way over onto its left side, you know, where, where you're working. Or I guess it'd be the, the right side. Yeah. So the right side, you're going to lay it all the way over. Boom, boom, boom. Now, in that case, like we were talking about earlier, where a guy broke a plate. If you break a plate, we would take off the ignition cover 
check the fuel filter and depending upon the bike style we would pull that off where the stator is and flush out both sides blow with air all the way through and then it, and if you spray with contact you want to blow it all out with air you're going to have a mess going on with whatever you do and that would pretty much get it all um and it works works good we've had to do it so Wow, right on. Well, listen, we are kind of deep in here, so I think it's time for a product spotlight. Ta ta okay, how far are we in? 25 minutes. Okay, that's good. Product spotlight today, ODI, Flight Podium Bars, and these are the Champ Bin. We found these to be really good for most bikes. I think the only guys, I get a lot of guys ask me about tall bars and risers, and I, I think you need to be over six foot to really start considering those those things because the bikes are set up pretty well for a wide range of height. I, I'd say from five, six, five, seven range to six foot, that five, six inches is fine. And most of the bikes have a forward position on your triple clamps where you can move the bars forward if you so desire. But these bars and then lock on grips like these uh, from ODI, these are the Imig uh, V2 lock on grips and just life changing and how much easier and less effort it is to to run lock on I have grips. to admit that when they first came out I didn't like them and now there's no way I would use anything else right honestly it's like I don't know what changed. I think they got their materials down and whatever else but they are simply amazing grips to use well I worried they were too thick not too thick at all I mean it's like and then they come with different cams and they have a paper in there that tells you what cam you need for your bike so really important to check that if you have bars that aren't ODI bars, one of the things they do here is they have a minimal knurling. So if you glue a grip on, it still works. But on some of the bikes out there with other brands of bars, they have really tall knurling. And on those, you'll need to sand down some of that knurling to get it all knocked down so that you can slide on the left side grip onto the bar. If you don't, if you try to hit it on, you're going to break the grip. So, And I have videos showing how to do that, how to sand down the bar on a different you brand a bar if, if your left side is not fitting. But overall, just really just love them. Ease of installation, everything. Um, you can clock them wherever you want the, the position and make both sides the same wherever you like them. Do you remember having to pull the KX grip off and it was vulcanized on there and you have to grind it off and then use the wire wheel and the grinder to get this? Cody and I were awesome at it. So we covered in black stuff and we yeah. just at the grinder just going zoom, yeah. zoom, zoom to, to put our grip They on. really did not want those grips coming off. No. It was, I'm sure it was a legal thing. Same reason they ran cotter pins for a long time. Oh, yeah, the castle so, nut. The yeah, pins, so yeah. I'm sure that's a legal thing. So anyway, uh, ODI in our spotlight today for the product spotlight. Really happy with the grips on anything. And if you are looking for a different bar, we feel like that, oh, that, that champ bend is a pretty good bend. We do run the... Uh, CFT is their crossbar style. I run that on some of the bikes like uh, It's on that bike behind Donnie right now because that bike doesn't vibrate a lot So I, I will if it's a bike that maybe vibrates a little bit more. I like the more open one I do kind of like seeing that crossbar there I guess just because we're old and most of the bikes we rode a long time ago all had a crossbar better for the watch to go on there too Yeah, That's true. Yeah. I like to keep track of my long motos. Yeah. Yeah, for sure all right, are we ready go, for the next question? Let's go back in, yeah. Back oh in. man, it's like uh, we need Spencer here. It breaks up the, I know. the time. It, it does, doesn't it? It does break up the time. Uh, I did get a couple comments about his overalls, though. He needs to wear both uh, clips on his overall. Oh, he had one hanging off. Like yeah, he was like sexy guy. Sexy guy, yeah. Instead of farmer he, he has a he has a different pair now. I don't know if they were in the last show, but he has a blue pair now. Oh, okay, okay. nice. All yeah. right, uh, Jeff J. Hi, Jay. As I change the oil for the first time on my new KTM 300 XCW, the service schedule caught me by surprise. I've never owned a KTM before, but 45 hours between oil changes seems long. I feel I should trust the manufacturer's recommendations. Would you be good with this interval? Thanks. No, not at all. It seems crazy. And it seems like a mistake, honestly. It's got to be. It's yeah. it's probably says four to five hours right. and not 45. So Spencer's going to look that one up for us and have a picture of it right here. But that's where you go with some common sense. And with oil changes, like we were talking about clutches lasting a long time, depending upon the type of riding you do, you're going to just learn how long you can go. So if you're riding trail, a trail bike like that, I would say start with four or five hours, okay? and see how black the oil comes out. If the oil's coming out black or nasty looking, uh, then you need to go quicker. If it's coming out looking pretty dang good, then bump it up another hour or two next time. That's what I would kind of do. And, and on those bikes, they have a sight glass, so you can kind of see that it's if it's discoloring a bunch, that'll help you a bit. So, And on a two-stroke, the transmission oil isn't as critical, say, as a four-stroke that needs to have fresh oil that's going and touching the piston and th those parts as well. So 
Um, that seems like a crazy interval. Uh, I would not feel comfortable with that. That is a long time. <laughs> right. It's, it's like half of a piston. Do you on. notice that uh, you don't buy new cars too much, but you know, like I have a newer truck and it says to go 10,000 miles between oil changes. Like, they're crazy. Oh, these synthetics, they're trying to get people. It doesn't do. matter. I still go five. I feel odd at five. And right. I still do five. You know, yeah, I just. I did 2,000 miles. It uh, uh, was all I would always do in my little Toyota truck that yeah. I still have. 1987. How many engines have you had in that? No, that's it. Just that one engine. Yeah. How many thefts? No, just once. It got stolen once and okay. broken into like five times. Yeah, people like breaking into it. Because it's yeah. so easy, I guess. Terrible. All right. Uh, Rich S. Hi, Jay. I've been searching for a good remedy or repair for my stator cable grommet that goes through the engine case. Do you have a method of fixing this? I haven't seen any videos of you sharing a fix for this instead of buying a new one because I can't seem to find a new replacement either. Thanks for your advice. Okay, so first of all, this was like an 05 RM125, this bike. I remember this, and it, it actually didn't look that bad to me. I was like, hey, this looks pretty good. If you got a 20-year-old stator and it's working, I would just, I said, I told him to, you know, kiss it and say a little prayer and put it back in the bike. And then that part that was a little jacked up, I think I have a photo of it we can put here. Uh, there's, we actually just bought some recent, um, wire harness tape. It's a little easier to work with. It's more cloth based than black electrical tape. It doesn't get as gooey and messy. So, um, on Amazon, we just bought some wire harness tape and I'll show some of it right here and have a picture of it. But wire harness tape, we're able to just go around and you can just kind of build up a nice little layer and connect it back to the rubber piece and then right to the, the old wire sheath going around the wires. So that's what I would do and just make it look nice and tidy. And you're, you're on borrowed time anyway with a 20-year-old two-stroke stator. For sure. Yeah, you're not quite yet into the vintage area, and you're not a new. So it's like a, the in-between. And and, mo and most of those stators are not available. So you're having to buy a used one, or there's some companies out there that are doing them. But They're redoing yeah, them. It's, it's, it's going to be tough. All right. Uh, Joe from Show 7. Hey, guys. Loving the podcast. What are your thoughts on the best way to transport a dirt bike? Truck? Truck versus trailer versus van versus hitch carrier. Any thoughts, pros and cons? <laughs> I think you and I know the answer to this one. And it said Joe Computer. So I'm wondering if this is Joe, Joe Computer from Show 7. And I, I think I'm it's like, got to be Joe Holler, dude. I, I'm, I'm thinking this is a plant. Joe Holler. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been. I do have a Joe Holler from my motorhome. Oh, nice. Yeah. And that's nice. Do you have any photos of the bike on there? Yeah, a bunch okay. of them. Let's put one of those in here. Okay. Okay. Let's put one of those in here because yep. those are great. Now, Joe Haller, we've seen, and I actually just put my son-in-law on one that was like an off-brand somebody had made, and it was a bit sketchy. But Let me they, tell you that Joe Haller, that guy's legit, and yeah. he basically almost makes you anything you want if you're a local. Right. And, and so Sorry, but I just thought, because I've been down there a couple times, yeah. he made one that my 890 and my race bike will go on at the same time. So you have, you can hold two. Yes. So we got to get a picture of that. So that, and I've seen on his website, he's shown the different ones. So I will say that to me, the, the hitch hauler, we'll call it is good for those that are, can't, that can't get a truck or a van. I mean, that's your, and in this situation of Donnie's where he's got his motorhome, he, he doesn't want to have to take another, uh, he was on a pull trailer and he doesn't want to have to take another vehicle. So where he's going, he's going to be able to secure the bike safely and, and have him locked up on his, on his hitch hauler. It goes in the, the back. The back. Back. But I put a hitch on the front, so I actually could carry three bikes, two on the back and one on the front. And I was I primarily started using it to go to works races when I – because I have a tendency to drive a little quick, even in my motorhome. It's a lot better than having to. Oh, I would just run that thing wide open. I'd have my bike on the back and just go to the works race. And you'd put, you'd pit with your buddies. Yeah. Yeah, I remember this. Okay. Yep. So so anyway, my, my first thought is that a van is ideally the best. If you can afford to have a moto van, because it's always set up. It has your tools in it. It has all your junk in it. It smells and looks like a like a moto van, right? So a moto van is ideally the best. And now that we've gotten in, I've moved off of uh, E250s and into a Sprinter van. It's hard to not ever. Well, listen, in Southern California, if you go to the track, um, there's certain parking for Sprinters and parking for everybody else. You can't park with a Sprint. You know, there's a lot of segregation going on. Because well, it's getting to be where there's hardly not any Sprinter. Right, it's all Sprinter. And it's pretty nice being able to stand up back there to gear up load up it's just so nice it really is so i'm sold on the van to me that's the best the pickup truck is great and going riding you can and you then you can use your pickup truck for many other things you're we're using it for work whatever the downside is we've seen tons of videos especially out here in california and, and any other big cities you can't leave that thing un 
watched. You know, it's going to, people are going to steal that stuff so quick. So My buddy had his stolen and he went to a restaurant and he was backed up someplace and somebody else backed up next to it, cut the tie down, flipped the bike over into the bed. It's all on video. And it's really 15 seconds. The bike was gone. So quick, so fast. They didn't care about, they just flipped it right over to the next yep. bed and didn't tie it down or nothing. Nothing. Just took oh off. no, they just took off. took off. So that's, that's what your face is. So that's my biggest worry on a, in a pickup truck In a van, you're a lot more secure. Okay. Well, also we take those trips too. And like when you're in uh, Utah and we're yeah. done and we go, you can go with six people in two vans easily. Yep. It's it's nice. We yeah. we had a bunch in our van. Yeah, in our van we had four in ours. Yeah, and it's it's really nice to to be able to do that. One other nice thing, one other recommendation on that too. When we park at a hotel or wherever, uh, even with our van, we disable the van so that it can't start. We we found the fuse. We'll just uh, we look up the fuse for the uh, fuel pump. Yeah, unplug that fuse. Set it, set it set it aside. I mean, now anybody that goes and finds my van, they're gonna know. But yeah, but we've even time. but we've even backed the vans yeah. back to back. Back yeah. So we will back the vans up and then disconnect it so that it can't be started. And they're out there. It's gonna crank over, but they got no fuel pump. It's not gonna you know start. So yeah. it's gonna be a mess for them. So that's one thing. You know, you can't be too cautious. The hitch haulers are great. Like I said, for like your case, or if you got the you say uh, up in Utah, a lot of guys have hitch haulers and stuff yeah. because they have the young family. They got the uh, expedition or whatever, right? The explorer yep. expedition, whatever it is, for mama to drive the kids around. Yeah, and then they get a ride once a month or whatever. So they got to put the hitch hauler in the back and drive mama's. I see that a fair amount here too, yeah. but, so, like down here. So that's another good option is like with a Joe Holler type situation like that on, t on the back of the uh, expedition. Yeah, I think any way you can get to the track is good, right? right? That's, that's, that's but if you have your choice, the van is the by far. It's not right. even, there's not even a close second. And the downside of the moto van is it usually ends up being a dedicated vehicle that you're not using for family use. Typically, uh, yours is set up well to where you can still use it on vacations. Yeah. So most of the time, they don't end up getting used for the family I've stuff. I've made mine like a convertible and, you know, I put those other seats and stuff. In. Right. So, uh, so it's really good. For I have a family. pickup and I've never even had a bike in the back of my pickup, <laughs> which is whatever. You know. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Next one. What do we got? All right. Eric H. Hi, Jay. I currently run a 1552 sprocket on a 2018 FE 350. I would like second gear to have the same ratio as first gear has now. What sprocket size would achieve this? I'd like how first gear feels in tight stuff, but sometimes I need a lower gear. 1348 question mark. Okay. So first of all, first thing you do with bikes is you're not with, if you're going to change gearing or look at ratios, what he did was really far away from what was stock. Most bikes, it would be one counter shaft to be the most you'd ever change or one or two, three on the rear. That's it. It's in that range, right? You're not going to, you know, go that different. And with gearing, you're left with the same ratios that the bike has. If you change the front, they're, they're say you change the, you put, you add two teeth to the rear, it's tough to make those gaps different on the stock transmission. You're left with what, what it is. Most bikes nowadays, um, usually one tooth on the rear, usually adding a tooth, there's very few bikes you can take a tooth away. Usually adding a tooth will allow you to be able to ride, like say at the track, like in third gear, so forth. And then on this uh, EXC type bike, right? It was an EXC type bike? Uh, was, yeah. And on that bike, you know, your key, these bikes that come, they come with really uh, tall gearing, we'll, we'll say, where it has tons of top speed because it has to be really quiet to pass, pass emissions. So most of those bikes will go to a 14 front and a 51 rear is usually pretty close. If you get a gear ratio chart, and we'll put one up here. FE350. FE350, yeah. yeah, which is the street legal version. So you put your... You have a chart and you can see the ratio with your stock gearing and you go, hey, I want to go to this. Or And some guys will actually want to go from a 13 front to a 14 front uh, and that will allow the suspension to work better. A lot of guys would do that with Honda 450s and run, end up running a similar gearing, go to a 1452 over a 1348, you know, those types of things. So uh, those are things you can do. That ratio chart will help you a lot and you can just Google gear ratio chart and find a good chart. It's really easy. Um, and to, to look and play with that. And if you have any certain questions about a certain bike, regular bike, not some oddball thing that's really old or whatever, I can, I can give you my, our advice and our thoughts on it. But the only bikes that need a ton of help for the most part are the street legal ones that come with really tall gearing. 
to pass those emissions and so forth. Yeah, but what is the, or do you know what the load is on the engine, say, because some of the gear rushes end up being the same final gear, right? Mm-hmm. You have a 1552, mm-hmm. that's a 14, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. So, but there's a different load and the, RP, the engine RPM run at a different RPM. That's way out of my pay grade, man. We're just, but you know what I'm saying? Like that's going. that's that's the problem with getting into these weird gears is you're yeah. actually changing where the bike should be running. Right. And and that's and that's why it's usually pretty close to stock. I mean, the bikes nowadays are so good. Anything in the last 5 or 10 years, the bikes this the gearing is so good. This brand new 23 20, 20 no sorry 24 300 xcw has got amazing gearing and has a 45 rear two sprocket i saw that 45 and i'm like oh for sure we're going to need to change that we, we rode it up in the mountains we're in third gear and all these trails down to second third I'm like if we put a 49 on here or, or i mean a 47 or something if we went up yeah man we'd be in trouble we'd we'd be you know in fourth and fifth gear on all the all the yeah, way around everything on these trails well so, the, you, you got to figure these manufacturers have done some testing to try to figure this out and on that new bike i will say that transmission on that xcw is so much better than i ever anticipated uh, yeah i'm not an xcw fan over the years but this new 24 300 xcw is so good and we just did a few mods to it recently and we i think we have some videos coming that will show some of that it's pretty awesome right on all right so timothy s wants to know what's your opinion on putting a street legal kit on a 23KX 450X, is there are certain things I should change with the gearing? And is the factory charging system good enough for running street lights? I'm also looking at the Dunlop D606 tire as well. Okay, so unfortunately, you know, as you know, Donnie, I'm a dream crusher, right, on a lot of things. You're listen to me. I've been around you a long time. You are a so dream crusher. He, he wrote me, and I was real tried to be as nice as I could to said, "Hey, this just isn't a good idea." Like it, that's a, that's a motocross bike. Even though it's a KX 450X, right? Yeah. So it's an X version, but it's really a motocross bike. It has a kickstand. It, it's the same transmission. It only has five speeds. The lighting system is not strong enough to power much of anything. So when you're buying, in, this goes for a Honda, KTM, Yamaha, all of them. If you buy a the their off-road version, the the X like the XCF on the KTM's, uh, the CRF 450X, for instance, on the Honda. If you buy any of those, it's just a motocross bike. And when you don't have that six speed, you don't have the proper uh, stator to be able to power everything. You're doing so much work to make that thing legal. You got so much garbage going on, right? Yeah. Adding on. It, it, to me, it's just not worth it. I would ride that bike or sell it and then look, ride it the way it is. Maybe not street legal. Um, ride it the way it is and enjoy it or sell it and look to buy a like a Honda CR450. Uh, the problem XL. is, the problem with him trying to do this is they're, like, I mean, I know that I've been on the KTM bandwagon too, but the KTM, the EXCs are so good. The EXCs are so good. And if you buy a 500, it doesn't need much of anything. Now, I say that with the caveat that, you know, we got 30 more horsepower out of one just by doing an ECU and a muffler. But that's the thing. So yeah, but how much money does he want to spend to do this? That's going to be craziness. Right. So, so if you buy an EXC, you're spending money to kind of make it run like it should maybe get some of the cobby stuff off right that rear fender piece is kind of overkill yeah so change that out make it run better but you're not having to add stuff on and that's well, some it- of the point too look I, I i've been doing this my whole life and even when i wasn't part of doing things like this it's like well I kind of like customizing things anyway. So you want to make it your own, yeah. right? And there's a lot of pieces out there. So even though on the EXC, you change the real tailpiece and you you put an ignition and stuff in it. Well, I don't, not doing that because I have to. I'm basically doing it because we want to, right? Right, right. And you want to be able to ride it like you can and take it off road. And, right. And so unfortunately, I just feel like if you're looking to turn something into a dual sport, it's better to find a dual sport if you can. Now, if you're on a real limited budget and you want to do it, and if you're out of California, you can get away with that like in Arizona and other states that are a little bit more laxed on what you can do. And that D606 is a great legal tire to do that with. Also, our K950 rear is a good street legal tire. Hey, GL rode that entire trail ride with us on a 606. (laughs) He's also a lot better rider than us, but he was riding a stock 500. Yep. No, is a stock muffler that you could barely hear was running, and stock ECU, and those 606 tires were the only upgrade. He was wheeling up hills I could barely make it on. Right, 
<laughs> so that's pretty good. So yeah. it shows that you can do it with anything, and and that and that a stock EXC is plenty good. Well, even though the, like we say that about the six hundred six and the EXC, I mean, compared to the bikes that we were riding twenty years ago, the, everything about everything we're riding is better. Yes, without a doubt. So. I, I get so I rode this weekend, and I was I was on a twenty three two fifty F uh, gas gas that I have, which is the older generation KTM. And just it felt so amazing. I'm like, how good is this bike? And this fuel injection, everything works so well. It, it's just it it's fun. Yeah, to be so to fun. riding the bikes we are now. So what do we got? All right, Matthew K. Do you have or can you make a video on what you carry your dual sport adventure in your pack? We get this question a lot, and here's the problem: we don't carry a whole lot. I can tell you right now, we carry a toe strap, and like we have a, a, a Motion Pro has a T with an eight, a ten, a twelve, and a, maybe a wrench, a bunch of zip ties, some cutters. And then we have more snacks and, and, and more snacks and things and water. Water, fuel, and snacks. <laughs> water, fuel, and snacks than we do anything else. And this goes back to the last question, Donnie, where the bikes are so dang good, knock on wood, we don't have a lot of problems. So as long as you're not a big crasher um, and you maintain your stuff and you're riding newer bikes, you don't hardly need anything. And, and, most, and I will say most of the rides we're going on, we're not that far to at least get down to a road to where we could get either ride it out with whatever's wrong or get picked up or whatever. So we're, we're, you know, we are, we do carry a toe strap to help, you know, in some situations and we have had to do that. It's been a long time. Uh, but for the most part, we don't carry a full pack with stuff because I'm already carrying, uh, my, my, my motto is I'm already carrying enough extra weight. I don't want to carry any more. And when I'm done with a trail ride, a four or five hour trail ride, even my pack the way it is, which I really like the OGO and the USWI has these packs that cross the here, the man's ear. And I like those packs, but when I'm done riding, man, a couple hours later, I feel like I still have a pack on because I'm not used to riding around with a pack on. So it, it, it definitely, and when I can go a section, sometimes we'll ride from the van and just go do like an hour section and come back. I won't even take a pack and it just feels like a vacation. I'm just like, this is awesome. It's like, I'm like at the moto track out trail riding. And Spencer will bring a water bottle in his pack for me, and it's awesome. If I know we're only going to go out for just the hill climb portion or something, you know, I'd, I'd like to do that. So. I started riding with some old school uh, dirt bike editor guys, and when you'd start riding off road with them, when I was young, they'd give you a pack, and then they would try to <laughs> fill it up with everything, like a thirty millimeter, and you know, the, the giant three quarter inch drive, and all this stuff. So they would want to make it as painful as possible. On right. you, you know, this what it conjures up that kind of memory for me. <laughs> I, like, I could really totally much. see it. So, luckily, we don't carry a whole lot. It's, yeah, and so unfortunately, I'm not a big help on that. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sure there's some really good off road dual sport channels that would have some stuff and i'm sorry i don't have more good word for you and that's another light subject is i'm not a huge trail rider even though we post it a lot i like to go out in a controlled deal i'm not a big adventure guy like i don't go out for five days uh, i'm still more of a moto guy at heart and then the trail riding we do when it's wet in southern california in the winter getting up to the desert going on a three to five hour trail ride we're never very far away from being able to bail out if we had to to get to a dirt road. There's always a road close. We could get to a dirt road and then go get the, somebody could go get the van and drive it to where we had to, if we had to. Yeah. So even though we're remote and in those places, we can kind of get out of there if we had to. And then in the, in the summer stuff in the mountains, a similar thing, we're never too far. Even if we're at 10,000 feet, it's nothing too terrible. So uh, my rides, I tend to be still, uh, I call it a light trail rider in the sense i'm not looking for hard enduro i'm looking for easy enduro and uh i want it to you know kind of on a nice schedule in the middle of the day you know that whole thing i don't think you you, you do everything abbreviated right in and out yeah all right i think that's enough for the show today that's a lot man we got yeah. through a lot it's uh i think we're rounding up it's time for our cd uh -huh. right yep i got a treat for you guys today because i have a band from the early 90s but what's cool about this is they have a brand new album this came out uh mid-summer in 23 and this album is so dang good uh the cd if if this album and, and there's been a few other people have said it when you with within the music when we in, in reviews and stuff if this album came out you know uh 30 plus years ago this thing would have been huge. I think this would have been a, a big album for these guys. So this is Extreme, and this is six. Hardly, this is only their sixth album. So they didn't go very tough on the uh, name, right? 
just a really good, and uh, they have a really good guitarist. Nuno's their guitarist, and I just actually went and saw these guys. The first song's Rise has this incredible solo, and there's just a wide range of songs. And uh, if you're looking for good new music, I would check out this this album, and you can you can listen to it on your Spotify and Amazon Music, all that stuff that's on there. I still like to get the CD now and then. It was kind of cool. So great album from a really cool band. Got a bit of a funk sound, and and they got some hard stuff, some soft stuff. They're really most known for their ballad that. Uh, what's the, what's the uh, about the uh hold on uh, the more than words yeah more than yeah yeah words. so like the the mushy love song so i think people are used to you know that got hooked on that come see them they're like blown away that like it's pretty hard so yeah yeah so that's that's uh six from uh, extreme really good album from 2023 and i have a new album i'm going to share from 24 probably next in the next it's time always too. so exciting when these old bands mm -hmm. Come out with something new. Yeah, not always, but and no, and, but I'm just saying yes. it, the the part for me is they're grinding it out. If yeah, that makes and sense. and they, and they put you can tell they put some really good effort into make something good. And yeah, even that ACDC album, pretty decent for a bunch of old old dudes. You know, yeah. One of the problems I have, and this is for for all any music lovers out there, is this album will never hit the same as it did in 1990 or 89 or 87, whatever, because of a few things. Right, here's what I believe is back then you'd still hear a few of these tracks on the radio. You'd see them on MTV, some videos, right? There'd be this buzz created. There's none of that. There's zero of that because there's no one playing rock music on the radio, right? There's no no one playing new music. So there's nothing that can help us. Yeah, and that. MTV doesn't play videos. Yeah. They so, play ridiculousness and that's right. it. <laughs> so so unfortunately, new new and there is some good bands that make hard rock music now, good music that's decent and everything, but no one knows about it. There's some good bands out there, Dirty Honey, and there's some uh, black uh what is that? Ah, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it up next time. Yeah, but anyway, there's that. some good new music out there. Like a lot of them, um, some some I don't. But it, it's going to be tougher to have the same hit as say when Def Leppard's album, when that's getting played on the radio all over and over, and then you listen to the CD, so it just has much more of an effect, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I just don't think we're ever going to get that anymore. I think we're past that. So anyway, good one. If you guys like some good rock. There you go. Donnie, what do you got to uh, close us out? Well, I got a, a two-part question for you because I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, uh, first is, as an older guy, how would you uh, recommend an older guy to start writing new? And how would you recommend when they want to get their kids into writing? Like, what are the tips you would have okay. for them fine, to get fine. into writing? Okay, first of all, find the question from the guy that had the long the long question. And then I'm going to start answering that. And we can say his name at least. He And I'll, I'll recap. He had a no, question. I'm not kidding. I didn't read the question. He, he had a question in there. And he talks. It's a little bit longer. He's, he got back into moto after being off for years. And now he's back. And he, has, he had his own business. Um, oh, right here. He says. What's uh, his name? Kenneth N. Okay. Kenneth, see, we, we didn't get to this one. We don't get to all the questions every week. Well, there's a lot of questions. Yeah. So what did what he okay, say? Okay, can you please send me your plans for the tire stand? Oh, this so if you guy, need right? the tire stand drawings, while well, Donnie's catching up on that, you can email us for the tire stand drawings. You can do that all the time. You hear about that. Okay, so, so we send email. Please send me a print of yours. I love your channel. Wish I could have done the same. Instead, I worked as a general contractor for 30 plus years. Dirt bikes have always been, is this the one? Yeah. Dirt so bikes have always been contractor. part of my passion. Yeah. Life just got away from me. Now I'm at the point uh, where life and money isn't as important. Living life is. And I started following the lead with dirt bikes and riding as much as possible. Um, and he said, I hope you're to be down in the area and riding with the icons. Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. So okay. he, I got goosebumps when I listened to this because this guy, this guy is, I don't want to say, you know, he's realized after working, he's, he's provided for his family, got yeah. a house, done, done all those things you're supposed to do, right? But he's missed out on riding for those 30 plus years of yeah. that big gap, which you and I didn't. So we've been blessed that we, did, we were able to still work our regular deals and be able to ride, you know, plenty and stay into it and not lose that. When a guy loses it, it's it's tough. And so for for this guy, he I, when I wrote him back, I was real nice because I thought it was really cool that he's realized this, the error of his ways, so to speak. I said, don't let it happen again. <laughs> yeah, that's, what right, I, right. that's the main thing I always tell guys. Don't let it happen again. Because the thing is, with dirt biking, there's a high chance you're going to get hurt. So then you're going to get hurt and you're like, oh. It's not if, it's when. Right. So unfortunately, that's going to be a thing. So yeah, you stick with it. You'll be fine. So yeah, I guess, so one of the the recommendations i give like a guy you're saying a new guy getting back an old guy getting back into it yeah is just you know pump the brakes you know enjoy what you're doing 
A lot of guys go, oh, well, just trail ride. Well, obviously, I got plenty hurt trail riding, and I think I actually have kind of more injuries trail riding or play riding than I do at the track. I told my neighbor, my neighbor was just talking about his son riding at a track, and he mm-hmm. goes, what do you think about that? I go, oh, it's going to be, you're going to have a great time. And he goes, well, is it more dangerous? I said, no way. I said, first of all, you're going the same direction. Is it as dangerous? You bet. They're all the same. But I'm saying it's not more dangerous to be on a track. Right. You know, I go, you're going all the same direction. So head on on a trail is basically not possible here. Yeah. Right. And you know what's coming up. Exactly. So that's where I tell guys. So I say start small. If you have a field where you can start and just have a simple track, start where you're just having fun on, say, a track situation. And then if you go to a track, start with their beginner tracks, you know, start there. You know, don't just run straight out to hit the main track and hit the big doubles and triples. That's where the problems come in is if you're getting outside of your skill set or what you're ready for. So enjoy yourself. And then as far as trail riding goes, go with, try to find some, a group or other guys you can go with. They're going to be helpful to you and keep you in safer situations. Uh, trail riding can be fine. And most of the trail crashes are fairly slow to where you're okay. Where you come into trouble, trail riding is exposure, I call it, when you're on a uh, 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 say there's a mountain like this and you're on a trail right here and you're going to fall this way and there's nothing to save you when you f- start falling this way you're going to roll down we've all seen the videos right so stay in safe situations um until you get your skill set up and have more confidence i guess would be the big you know advice i'd give stay in that deal and then i get a lot of questions lately a lot of questions about we have a video on tips on buying bikes so that's in our google doc if you need help buying bikes because that's a next another question that comes is there they have been out of it for 20 years what do i go get for a bike and they got this much budget or this and a lot of them are looking at used bikes and they got this much budget and and what do i get in here and so it can be tough so guys will actually send me links to two or three bikes they're looking at and i'll tell them i'll real quick i'll open it and i'll go boom 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 and i'll give them my thoughts think about this 30 years ago we didn't have to think about what bike, to, only what brand to buy, <laughs> right. because you were only buying a 250. A, a CR250 or YZ250. CR250 or YZ250, yeah. RM250. Yeah. That's it. Uh, even at the time, I wouldn't have bought a KX250, <laughs> but that was it. And now look at all the different choices everybody yeah. has yeah. to get started riding. And and one of the big comments I get when guys are looking at used bikes is that, you know, guys like, hey, I got this budget, say he's four to five grand using this range. Which 450 should I buy? It's like, well... At this point, you know, if you're looking at a 20, you know, 16 to 2020 or whatever, it doesn't really matter what brand. It's more about how good a shape the bike's in, that's how it. low hours, because they're all so close in that sense that that's going to be a bigger factor. So, uh, so making sure that you're, if you're getting back into it, that you're on the right bike, um, you can be safe and just go slow. And it's not slow riding, but that you're getting it. Pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. Yeah, you know? right on. Like, don't, you don't got to be taking some, you know, you're, you're not you're not going to turn pro. I, we always joke around. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that, at all. That ship has sailed, so you missed out on that. So anyway, that's a great last question, Donnie. It was funny you read that guy's mind. Uh, what was his name? Kenneth Ken- N. Kenneth N. So it was really cool. He, he has, you know, went through life with his own construction business, now has the funds and time. Hey, I'm going to do this before it's too late. And that, and honestly, I get a lot of that. Sometimes when I do certain trails, I did a trail with Spencer the other day and I said, man, I didn't think I was doing that trail again. You know, now I'm turning 55 soon. Yeah. And I was like, I shouldn't do that trail again. And I'm, you know, it's like, I'm probably going to do it again. Yeah. You know, the problem is that not the problem, but the way it is, is that once you've sat and ridden a dirt bike, like on any level, like consistently. So if you were 16 and you rode it for two years or a year dirt bikes everybody listening will know it just sticks with you yeah i don't know anything else that sticks with you like that yeah no for sure because if you played football or baseball when you get to be 35 it's like you don't really want to go play is there a place you can go play by yourself this is probably team (laughs) sports right you can go in a field like you just said right and go you know make a turn track on a field yeah but if you're playing football you got to have somebody catching that ball (laughs) right Right. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, that's been really fun. That's a good look at uh, show number eight, right? Number so, eight. Number eight is great. And uh, uh, thank you, Donnie, for everything. Hopefully, we'll have uh, Spencer back at the next one before he heads back to uh, back to regular life in Utah. So, been a real fun time. If you guys like what you see, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, remember to share it with your friends and be cool. We'll see you. We work with some great companies, and here's a list of those right now: Dunlop Motorcycle Tires, Wisco Piston. Vinco Air Shocks and Dirt Bike Parts, FMF Exhaust, Decal Works Graphics, Pro X Racing Parts, Recluse Clutch Revolution, Motion Pro Specialty Motorcycle Tools, 
Works Connection, Uni Filter, Klotz Oil, Cometic Gasket, MX Plastics, JE Pistons, Cardo Systems, ODI Bars and Grips. And remember, if you shop Rocky Mountain, use our link from our site, Linktree, or link in the description of the videos. Thanks for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.